Guten Abend, sehr verehrte. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ernst Brugger, and I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this open forum session. And uh, I shall like to now explain how things will proceed. After a brief introduction of the subject and after introducing our panelists up here on the podium, we shall have an initial round of questions which uh, pertain to the central theme as to whether biodiversity and the requirements that are posed by society today in that regard, whether they are going to substantially change the conditions in which business must operate and how business should, can, or must react. We shall then initially have a discussion among ourselves. We'll have a debate up here, and then later on there'll be an opportunity for uh, the members of the audience to uh, ask questions too. There'll be a 25-minute period uh, which, uh, during which you'll be able to have a good think about what you might want to ask later. And eventually, right at the end, we will try to sum up the essence of the discussion. I, I will moderate the panel in English um, after this introductory statement. Um, you've all got headsets and you can listen. You can listen to and speak uh, English and German. The occasion, of course, is uh, it's, an, it's a joint event together with uh, the World Economic Forum, the WEF, and the IUCN, the World Conservation Union of Switzerland. Achim Steiner is the Director General of IUCN. He's one of the panelists. He's sitting right next to me. The IUCN is an organization which has almost 1,000 members. Almost all the world governments are represented there. Many uh, ministries, many NGOs are represented there, non-governmental organizations, that is. It is a unique uh, worldwide union in the environmental field, which is particularly powerfully concerned with biodiversity issues, the protection, the integrity, the diversity of uh, uh, the uh, biodiversity is the principal concern of this organization. And I would like to express warm thanks to Achim Steiner and his organization f for uh, having uh, made that commitment. We have a very unique panel up here. We've got two distinguished business personalities. We've got two very important representatives of major NGOs, as I've already mentioned, and the fifth member, the fifth panelist, is one of the most prominent leaders in the NGO field from India. So I think this is an interesting panel up here on the podium, and I have no doubt that we're going to have a very interesting discussion. Biodiversity, ladies and gentlemen, means everything that lives, everything that's living on this world. It's the animals, the plants, it's human beings, it's the microcosmos. Everything falls under the umbrella of biodiversity. And a healthy biodiversity is something which I think is self-evident for, for us in most instances. What it means is that we, we need access to fresh to, to clean water, that we've got soils that can go on producing, that we can breathable air, which isn't uh, too badly polluted, and that also we can, we, we, that the, the weather is reasonably stable, with the major exceptions that we're all too familiar with now. This biodiversity is the foundation of our common life, our existence. It is, however, being eroded. There are statistics about the loss of biodiversity, and the pace of this loss has greatly accelerated in recent decades, and we are losing thousands of 
thousands of times more species nowadays uh, in the broadest understanding than we would have would be losing without the uh, effect of human intervention the human the human race our species is having a, a, a powerful impact on on the biosphere and to some extent this is a dangerous impact in that it is leading to the loss of genetic wealth and in this process of loss uh, all human beings are involved the conservationists the poor the rich but of course we all know that companies business in particular has a particularly massive impact on the environment they use natural resources they use energy it is they which uh, which extract resources from the from the soil from the ground they use a great deal of water it is companies that are the engines of uh, which drive a great deal of the use that is made of natural resources and so the question that is put to this panel is of course a very interesting one and the question is looking at these requirements uh, that uh, have arisen in regard to the protection of biodiversity are these requirements are these demands such that business faces entirely new prerequisites or new conditions regulatory and legislative uh, conditions uh, in which uh, which would enable them to effectively protect that biodiversity that I've been talking about. Now, because this is such, this is such an important uh, subject which concerns the very basis of our existence, there is a biodiversity convention which has been signed by almost all the countries of the world and ratified, which means that these countries, including Switzerland, that has also signed it, have committed themselves, and this is, goes back quite a long way, to enact, to adopt, and to implement appropriate legislation uh, for the protection of biodiversity. Notwithstanding uh, the convention, the loss that, uh, that I've already mentioned has not become less. It has not shown any signs of slowing. In other words, the impact of, of the biodiversity protection policy uh, haven't been that great so far. I mean, the effectiveness has not been that great. After this brief introduction, we come to the central question. What does it mean to talk about the necessary protection of biodiversity, and what are the implications of that for the behavior of the private sector and the actions of the private sector? No, let me very briefly introduce the panelists and before we get down to brass tacks. We've got, apart from Mr. Steiner, I've already mentioned Achim Steiner, who is the head of the IUCN, the World Conservation Union. He's a man who for many years now has been concerned with biodiversity, and he is one of the world leaders in this field. I think that's a, that's a fair statement. And to his, uh, moving along to his, uh, to the right of him, you've got Travis Engen. He's the president and CEO, chief executive officer of Alcan, which is a large uh, global concern and is a world leader in aluminium production. And this also has to do with uh, the mining of bauxite, as I understand it. Uh, it is also associated with the production and uh, with the generation and consumption of electricity, with the use of water. And then, of course, there's the whole range of aluminium products, recycling of aluminium products, and so on. So very many areas are involved. And moving further on, we have uh, Philippe Roch, who is best known in Switzerland as the environmental minister of Switzerland. He belongs to, uh, he's uh, head of the Swiss Agency of the Environment, Forests and Landscape, and, is concern and uh, takes care of the uh, biodiversity concerns in Switzerland, as well as worldwide. And then we also have Sir Mark Moody Stewart, who is sitting uh, to my right, who is chairman 
of a large firm known as the Anglo-American, uh, which is domiciled in England, is uh, heavily involved in mining, but not just mining of particular products, but uh, it's coal, uh, gold, coal, platinum, other metals too, also forestry, major investments uh, there. And he's also someone who is involved in the financing of projects. Uh, he, in fact, he heads um, a concern which, is, which deals with that. Now, moving on to, the, to his right, we see our friend from India, Ashok Khosla, who is the president of Development Alternatives in India. This is, and that is, a, this is a, an association in India. So this is somebody who takes a very innovative view to the to uh, alternatives, alternative forms of development in India, and is particularly concerned with the question of biodiversity and how both environmentally and sociologically or socially it's possible to develop projects which are meaningful. Well. You can see that there's a great deal of know-how assembled up here on the podium, and we want to make the best possible use of this know-how in the discussion which is going to follow. And now I'm going to switch to English so that to make sure that everybody can understand the questions. Our Q&A and uh, first dialogue round. And um, I would like to start with a question to, to Achim uh, Steiner. Um, Achim, if, if you would have to summarize First, just in one minute, what are the three most important biodiversity threats, problems? Huh? What, what, what do you think? What are the th biggest three threats or risks in biodiversity? That's a fairly straightforward answer, although <clears throat> maybe there is a question of whether one is more important than the other, but it is loss of habitat, i.e. the space where animals and plants can thrive. This is the fastest loss that we have, partly because the footprint of uh, our economy is expanding so rapidly and we have so many more people. Uh, the next one billion people on this planet will only take the next 20 years. It took us 1,800 years in terms of modern counting or the whole history of the planet to reach the first billion. Secondly, it is climate change. Uh, we believe, and last week some of you may have heard of the latest scientific uh, reports that are coming out, that uh, we may over the next 30 to 40 years face immense species loss through some of the projections with climate change. And thirdly, it's invasive alien species, not something from Mars, but something that uh, really comes with world trade and people moving plants and animals from one ecosystem to another and many of those can turn out to be displacement of local species and varieties. Those are the three threats. All of them relate to economic activity and to human activity and that is basically at the heart of biodiversity loss today. Would you say, Achim, that um, because of those threats that uh, there is a common understanding in the world, in the societies of this world, that one has to put new, clear rules, tougher rules probably, to business? I think the problem is that there isn't that understanding yet. I think the drama, the, the sheer magnitude and scale of change that is occurring today in terms of loss of biodiversity of natural environments is not yet being appreciated. So in terms of public policy, we are actually experiencing at the moment a phase where you would believe that environment is losing ground. People care less about it. The media says it's not important anymore. And one reason why we wanted to have this session tonight, and I'm so happy to have people from some very complex economic sectors here, is the interesting observation that some companies are probably realizing the magnitude of this change and the impact it will have on society and their ability to operate more rapidly than governments are. But in general, the realization, I think, is not yet getting through. Is this a realization because of lack of awareness or of know-how or of will for political decisions? I think it's two things. One is we just cannot imagine that uh, we will lose maybe 500, 1,000 species in the next 20 or 30 years. We've only lost about three to 400 over the last 500 years. 
So somebody who says today we will lose, you know, 5,000, 10,000 is just considered to be unbelievable. Secondly, it costs money to change the way you operate. And that is the big question. When do we actually see that the benefit of changing the way we produce, operate economically, invest in sustainability is actually higher than the cost of doing so? Now, Ashok, you, you are one of the um, real, concrete, uh, realistic experts in making biodiversity work. Is there, in developing countries like India, uh, is it possible to make um, from bio, with biodiversity protection a business? Is there a business case for biodiversity? Yes, I think there's a business case. I think there's a more important practical case. It's a matter of survival and life and death for our, for our own species and for the world. I think there's an ethical case, uh, but certainly there is a business case. But remember that a very large part of the biodiversity of this world is in the developing world. That's the tropics. That's where, for various historical and cultural reasons, it has been protected for a long, long time. And in many cases, in the north, which is Europe, North America, and so on, uh, a large part of the biodiversity was already lost a long time ago. Uh, in various ways. So uh, we are particularly concerned, not just as uh, uh, guardians of the world's resources, but also for our own survival, to maintain that resource base, that biodiversity, on which people, very large numbers of people, depend every day directly for their food, for their medicines, for all the economic uh, activities that they have. So <clears throat> from uh, the point of view of the developing world, of poor countries in the, in the tropics, uh, biodiversity is really a matter of life and death on a daily basis. And because it is, one has to recognize that um, they both pay a very heavy cost for any onslaught on, um, on biodiversity, uh, and also um, they, they depend uh, for the long term on it. Now, who is impacting the, um, the um, biodiversity in, in the South? Well, there are a lot of people who say it's the rich. It's the big companies. It's um, uh, nowadays fashionable to blame uh, people who tend to extract too many natural resources. It's not only fashionable, it's probably correct. It's a very large part of the problem. Uh, but the poor, through the exigencies or through the imperatives of survival also have an impact. And sometimes we forget that, especially when we work in the South, uh, because we need to protect the interests of the, of the poor. But we have to recognize that poverty itself uh, is a major threat, uh, because uh, just for survival, people, growing populations, have to extract what are called non-renewable, uh, sorry, renewable resources to an extent where they become non-renewable because they disappear. So uh, in other words, Ashok, um, uh, we have the biggest potential of biodiversity in developing countries. At the same time, that's just an additional question. In most of those countries, the quality of political institutions to be able to protect this biodiversity is rather poor. It's Would you weak. agree with that? Yes, it's generally weak. There are autocratic countries in the South also who can, uh, can enforce uh, their laws. But, but you're right. Uh, it's a matter of uh, weak governance that's uh, part of the problem. But you asked me a question about how business can relate to this um, biodiversity. I believe there are different kinds of businesses. You know, there's private sector consists of lots of things. Uh, and in Switzerland, you fully understand the range from very large companies, global in scope, to very small local companies. And my experience is that um, uh, companies that are uh, local in scope, decentralized, uh, are actually working on the ground, tend to have less of a negative impact on biodiversity than ones where there's a huge amount of concentration through natural resource extraction, through a variety of other things, uh, through creating pollution and uh, loss of habitat. So it depends on how we choose technologies, how we design our institutions, what are our economic incentives uh, to drive the private sector towards better behavior. Thank you. Uh, Travis, um, 
Ashok, I know, is working especially with micro small business. Not only, but that's his main focus. Huh? You, you are on the other side of business. Huh? This is big business. It's mining business. It's diversified mining business. It's worldwide active business, very resource intensive. Um, is for you biodiversity, what is it? Is it a, a threat or is it an opportunity? Well, I think uh, the first point I guess I would make is there obviously is a compliance element of biodiversity, uh, an uneven compliance element to the extent it was already addressed with uh, different uh, political uh, domains making different decisions about how to move or not move in this particular area. So we certainly see, uh, we operate in 63 countries and in fact in, because we're dealing with uh, let's say the production of aluminum, do we tip, to typically operate in areas which are quite remote, many times have not been developed before we've been in that region, and areas where we now have been operating for decades, I mean, some, you know, tens and tens and tens, 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, so yes, there is a compliance element, but what we have done in our company for quite some time now is, is to think more broadly about the question of how does our company last we're 102 years old. We last another 102 years. I mean, how do we make the enterprise sustainable? There's clearly a piece of that which is financial performance. Because if we can't perform financially, we, we will cease to exist. But that's, I would say, necessary but not sufficient. Uh, the financial performance is, is important because it is actually the resource that allows us to invest in, in people, in the way we practice our business, in new projects, and indeed, ultimately, satisfying the other stakeholders, including customers, that enable the financial success. So what we've tr actually come to over the last 10 years is a position where we think more broadly about sustainability, sustainability of the firm, but also sustainability in terms of environmental, economic, and social performance. And so I mean, I clearly put biodiversity in this category of things, not as a spe special category by itself. It's an important element. Uh, why do we do that? What is the reason. Well, the reason that so many of the areas, let's say environmental performance in particular, are important to us is not only are they the right thing to do, but you find that if you can develop best practices, they are often the most economical way to do things as well. And clearly, at least on the environmental side, preventing something from occurring in the future has a much better financial measure than dealing with the consequences of let's say a spill, or even loss of, loss of a species of animal. Yeah. Can you make a concrete example for that? Oh, I, well, with the, respect to the environmental, I mean, imagine the issues of uh, pollution of an aquifer compared to the cost. Uh, suppose you had a, an oil tank and you didn't protect it from a situation where if it ruptured for some reason, the oil would not go into the environment. The cost of that protection, by the way, is nothing. It's very small. The cost of remediation of the aquifer is it's impossible. I mean, it's incalculable. So, so the payback on environmental issues, and I think the same case can be made in, in, in biodiversity, is very high, the financial payback. The, but I don't want to go there. I mean, I think the real ultimate payback for our firm and for other firms who would aspire to thinking more in this way is actually that our opportunities increase. Uh, we do operate in, in very remote regions of the world and also in major, major urban areas. And we very much need to make sure that we are not just a tolerated participant in the society, wherever it is, but indeed we are a welcome participant. And it's our history, our track record, our performance, what we've done already, what we're doing already, which is the enabler for us to be the first partner of choice. And that's worth something. Business is about choosing and executing the right options. And if you don't get even a chance to be considered for the option, you're reducing your opportunities. So yes, there's a compliance aspect, but it is absolutely, in our view, a fundamental part of driving our business towards sustainability and, frankly, learning. We don't know today what we're going to know in five years in this respect. And certainly, I think collectively across this panel, we, we noted things today we didn't know 10 years ago. Thank you. We will, we will come back to some of uh, your arguments. Um, to develop them a little bit further and to see if everybody agrees here. Um, Philip uh, Rock, um, if, you under, if you listen to such a statement, huh, which is basically saying uh, for private business, this uh, biodiversity issue is even an opportunity. 
At the same time, we know that um, governments are not able alone to protect biodiversity. Is, is there room for new kinds of partnership between governments, state organizations, and private sector in biodiversity? I'm sure there is a room for this cooperation. I see two important arguments for business to be involved in, uh, in biodiversity protection. The first one is a global one. We all depend uh, from biodiversity. And I can just mention uh, Klaus Schwab in the publication we just uh, uh, distributed today. Our environment, we can also say our nature, our, our biodiversity, supplies what we need for life. And we all depend on an intact environment for our very existence. And economy business needs a sound environment to develop sustainably in the long term. In a chaotic world, in a destroyed world, there is no place for a good business. That's the global argument. But there are a lot of, uh, of specific arguments and a lot of specific relationships between business and biodiversity. Just let me mention two, three examples. The first one is agriculture. Perhaps business is not, uh, we do not use to, we're not used to consider agriculture as a business. It's the biggest business in the world and the most necessary. What can do agriculture without nature, without biodiversity, without, without wild genes, wild plants, without uh, safe soils? Agriculture is directly linked to biodiversity. A second uh, example is water. The value of water is huge. We do not pay real, the real price for safe water. But water depends in, directly from safe ecosystem, from forests, from wetlands, from these ecosystems where biodiversity develop. A third example would be the pharmacological industry depending more and more about what nature itself developed, uh, genes, uh, different substances. And many of the species which could provide solution for the future problem we will have to face in medicine, in industry, many of these species disappear be before we just had the opportunity to know them. So we are, this, by, this, by destroying biodiversity, we are destroying the capital of uh, the future business in all uh, sense of the world. And even for the poorest, because uh, uh, I used to say the forest, wild forest, is the first supermarket for the poor. And where the forest disappear, the poor lose their only revenue. So we really need, sub simply need to conserve biodiversity for the future of this world. And that's the first reason why governments and private sector have to cooperate to save this biodiversity. Okay, uh, Philip Rock, just, just an additional question. Um, your answer, um, is this a theoretical answer? Say should cooperate governments and private sector? Or is there in practice really some good experience going on? What is your experience? We, we, have, uh, we begin to have good experience on agriculture. The whole system of, of Swiss agriculture is based on that. So farmers in Switzerland we go down too small and uh, too bad condition to compete with the big US or European farmers need to play a role in conservation of biodiversity and they will receive some uh, compensation for that. And the future of the Swiss agriculture is directly linked to the conservation of biodiversity. The second example is uh, the access to uh, the genes and the uh, capital of uh, nature. And we are developing now an international, uh, the guidelines, the bond guidelines for access and benefit sharing to uh, biodiversity. And this is very important to give a framework for the exploitation of this natural capital so that the countries and the populations who sustainably conserve and uh, use this biodiversity receive some compensation for their work because without them, this biodiversity would have disappeared and they need support 
to continue to conserve it. And we are beginning to have some experience in that area, and we want to develop that so that industry, which needs this uh, living capital, will also provide these populations who conserve this capital the means to develop, to get uh, the necessary money to go to school and to, to develop themselves. There are huge works today in, in that direction, but the most of it is still to be done. Thank you. Mark, Ang um, Anglo-American chairman, big company again, earlier chairman of Shell for some years, big experience, not only good ones, because you were attacked as Shell, I remember. Um, uh, I think exactly uh, during uh, your time in, in high responsibilities in the firm. What, is, what are, in your views, the drivers for business, the motives in business, for business, for change, if there are drivers? I think the, the, the first driver is, is, is one of awareness, and awareness at, at all levels, starting at, at, at a high level, a very high level of of general acceptance of the uh, need for biodiversity. But that, of course, doesn't save anyone, uh, any species. The next is, is an awareness of, of climate, the impact of climate. It's one of Akim's uh, three major uh, potential damages of, of biodiversity. And, of course, uh, business, and society is having a, a clear impact on, on climate. And I believe that business, both the extractive industries and, and other industries, need to address this. But it needs to be done in conjunction with society. Then if you go down to the, the third level, uh, as uh, Ashok said, most of our actual operations are in, uh, uh, extractive operations are in developing countries. We need uh, there to look at our, our footprint, and the awareness comes very often from civil society organizations. If you go back some years, business was, uh, like much of society, not necessarily aware of its impact. So we had to look and see uh, and learn. I believe that many of those uh, local issues can be addressed but they need to be addressed within uh, a framework, as uh, Travis said, of uh, sustainable development. So not just uh, an environmental issue, not just a biodiversity <coughs> issue, an economic issue, and also a, a, a social issue. And as Ashok said, one of the great threats to biodiversity is also poverty. And I believe the extractive industries in developing countries can actually uh, use, uh, can generate wealth, which if wisely used, can contribute to the eradication of poverty. It's not always wise, wisely used, uh, and that's something that, again, I think society, uh, civil society and business need to work together to address. Um, so I think we can address two easy, relative we can work and have a responsibility to work on two of Achim's uh, uh, things which I have covered. The third, <coughs> alien species, is, is rather more technical and specialized. I'm also aware of the impact of tankers and so on on that. But, but that's I, I just come back with a question to you. Schnell auf Deutsch. Wir haben leider nicht gesehen, was die Botschaft war. Unfortunately, we couldn't see what the message was. Maybe somebody can convey that message to us in the course of the meeting, because it is, after all, an open forum. So maybe somebody could come up afterwards and tell us what was going on. Follow-up question on these motives. Um, and I would like to, to turn now into a, into a debate among us. Um, uh, we heard that biodiversity potentials are especially rich still in developing countries where, at the same time, the political framework, the legal framework, the administrative framework for protection of this biodiversity is rather weak. Okay? So in a certain way, for business and also international business, 
it would be an easy way, an easy way not to uh, comply too well with laws because nobody would really uh, make a big noise, okay? So, so you could use biodiversity in an inefficient way, in a non-controlled way, and I think some business does it also this way. So why is the hell, Mark, once again, should business not go this easy way as it did in the past for long decades in a certain way? Why should it change? Why should it, what, what are the motives and the drivers again? Why it should protect more than even governments are able to control biodiversity? Why? Well, I, I think you say that over the, over the years, business, I mean, it's over the years, society. Business is an, an aspect of society. The, the great deforestations of Europe were done, I suppose, in some ways by business, but, but we would say they were done by, by society at large. If you come to, to developing countries, it's the, the, the weak governance, which Ashok referred to, which both affects the, the way in which uh, businesses are, are run and also affects the, the utilization of the wealth created by that economic activity. And business has learned that uh, if you, and I've certainly learned that if you, if you run an effective business in a developing country to high standards, you pay your taxes honestly, you don't bribe someone, and the surrounding society is in a mess, sooner or later you will be blamed for it. it and we have learned that, that where 20 years ago we would have said that's a political activity, it is not our responsibility, I believe business increasingly comes to say as part of of society, we cannot operate in a completely uncontrolled environment. We need frameworks in which to, to operate, and in order to make sure that the wealth generated by society is spent in the general interest of society. And if you don't have that, you have a fractured society. Uh, we spoke of a fractured environment. Fractured societies are, are, are even more damaging than to my opinion. And, and it's a continual balance. This is not just a question of the environment or biodiversity. It's also a question of, of social impact. Travis. Thank you. Um, I, I think there really, I would start with three arguments here, uh, why this is important for business. The, the first argument is that over time, there is and will be a continuation of convergence of requirements or expectations. Uh, and we've seen this in other areas, not just biodiversity, but also in an environmental area in particular, that over time, the requirements around the globe are moving together. As more knowledge, as perhaps political systems develop to a level in certain regions, and so on and so forth. So we think, because we're operating facilities which are going to be in place for decades, um, half a century in many cases, that um, you have to say where are things going to be, not where are they are today. That's number one. Number two, our shareholders are in Western Europe and in North America. And our shareholders, unstated but very valid expectations are that we are operating every ray around the planet to the norms that they see in their own setting. And to the extent that us, for us or another firm, it, it becomes evident that that's not the case for some reason there is going to be a very and very measurable and immediate impact on the value of the firm. And so there is a very, very strong economic imperative as well, just on that side. And then a more technical argument within the firm is that we get better because we optimize and improve processes. Now, one of the roles of business in society, in my view, is business is the engine of productivity in society. Small business, agricultural business, at all level. It is the engine of productivity. And it's that improvement which gives the world a chance to improve the economic lot of everyone. That's not uniformly distributed, and obviously that is something which is also a challenge for the future. But inside the firm, 
if we focus our energies on having the best practices everywhere, we can improve those processes and take the lessons from one place to another, which has a real impact on the company's financial performance. So, so your response to the old question for multinationals, are you better off with a double or triple standard or with a one standard worldwide? You're saying one standard is more efficient for your company. Absolutely. Why? It's more efficient technically because we're improving the same processes and we can take what we know, what the engineers discover, what the operators discover, we can take that lesson and accelerate learning. So that, that you just, if you get better in one place, you can take the same ideas and improve in other places. That's key. Ashok, is there a difference between national companies without a home market in US or UK or Switzerland and local companies who just are in India and uh, maybe can a little bit gamble around in another way? Um, I think many of the, the um, <clears throat> competitive advantages that were just mentioned, listed, um, apply to companies on whom there is a great deal of pressure from shareholders or from governments and from clients, <clears throat> customers who demand better performance. Uh, being an environmentalist from a sort of systems point of view, I think it's a pity to have only one standard because uh, different places have different natural resources. And it is possible, if you're talking about competitive advantage, to conceive of doing something in one way here and totally different way here simply because it makes competitive sense. Because after all, nature does offer certain, uh, how would you say, um, <clears throat> resources that including the cleaning up capacity of the environment, which would give you certain uh, advantages. Unfortunately, the way the systems have gone around the world, that is no longer possible. And therefore, uh, I think virtually everyone advocates um, single standards, even though it may be very expensive and rather inefficient in some certain economic terms um, to do the same thing in the same way everywhere. <clears throat> However, it seems to me that um, uh, when you have extractive um, industries or big factories or refineries or big dams, or whatever it is that you're looking at, they tend to take people into remote areas where the biodiversity is who shouldn't be there. You have to build roads to get to them. You have to make uh, railway tracks to get to them. And in the process, you create vastly greater damage than actually is the case around your own industry. And my feeling is that uh, ultimately, it's not a matter of long decades or centuries, it's a matter of a few years, when the environmental awareness of people, whether they're tribals in that area or city-based NGOs or even governments, uh, who are going to call you to account. And if you've made a, you know, a billion dollar investment in either a mine or in a factory or in a refinery, uh, your shareholders are going, wherever they are, are going to ask questions. Now, national companies <clears throat> are uh, in some ways beginning to be even more accountable because their uh, targets uh, right in, in the domestic arena, the domestic economy, and while they may have got away with a certain amount in the past, uh, they are also visible and are going to find that they cannot behave uh, differently from from multinationals or from overseas companies. Uh, my impression from my own country is that uh, more and more accountability is being demanded of both national and international companies. Philip Rock, if you listen to this uh, debate, huh, which is till now, till now, saying firms may have an interest in performing better than the law huh, because in their self-interest, they may get better productivity, better efficiency in their structure on the one side, and better reputation on the other side, which is good in the market, okay? This is what we heard. Um, first, would you believe that? And secondly, Philip Rock, what does it signify for the setup 
of laws. There is a linkage between the philosophy of uh, the business community, the legislation and the public opinion. No one is independent from the other. And uh, the question of reputation is also an important question we was discussed. But if business needs good reputation in conserving biodiversity, it has to be based on the public opinion, which has to be strong. And the last time, I'm not very sure, even in our countries where we used to have a progressive environment policy, that these questions are still very present in the public. If I, if I just refer to the three main causes of biodiversity loss mentioned by Akim before, each of, one, each of them, loss of habitat, climate change, and invasive, in each of them, business, industry has a responsibility, but not exclusively. Most of the reasons are given by our needs. I don't want to mention Swiss politics, but the Avanti initiative is something like that. It's not industry. It's the population that will vote in two weeks. Do we want more roads in Switzerland? And the main problem of biodiversity in Switzerland is given by roads, not by industry. So if we want to make pressure and to, to make credible what has been said around this table, we have to have a strong public opinion. And the role of the state is also to create the framework conditions to foster this spirit. If possible, not to be too precise in the regulation. Let some space for the best solutions brought by the business and by the people. But we have to have a clear framework, and that's the responsibility of the state. So I think we all have to take our task seriously if we want to make progress in that direction. Achim, um, would you agree that public opinion is probably more important than law? And um, if that is correct, if that is correct, how does one from your side, IUCN, huh? all the countries, all the governments, a lot of NGOs involved in IUCN. Is, uh, could that be, or is that already your strategy to, to get to more transparency, a better communication about that, as a precondition for public opinion? Absolutely. I, I think public opinion is absolutely central to, to a company's right to operate. I and mean, we call it a license to operate as a term, but Public opinion, and in democracy, thankfully, laws still follow public opinion and not the other way around. So in most countries of the world, it is public opinion and then through parliament that it invokes laws. But I think the, the real dilemma we face at the moment is that it is very difficult to understand what is actually happening around us because there are some companies who project themselves as being very good companies, very good social or environmental operators. The fact of the matter is when we tried to put this panel together here, we had to go a long time before we found two credible CEOs who would be willing to come into this open forum here. We also know that it is not business in general that we're talking about here. We have to be, and this is, I think, one of the key challenges, ask ourselves how do we distinguish between those businesses that are willing to take the steps that Travis and Mark and, and uh, Philip and Ashok have talked about and those that couldn't care less. And there are lots of them in this building next to us here. They couldn't care less at the moment. But the interesting thing is they couldn't care less because they haven't realized yet what some of the strategic, and maybe that is the interesting thing, some of the companies have longer-term visions. Travis alluded to it. You have to operate for a 50-year horizon, so you look 50 years ahead. I actually believe that in 10 years' time, environment will be the single most important variable to license to operate, simply because of the disasters that you can see everywhere in the world. Transparency is a crucial part of allowing the public opinion to do something about it. And I just want to show you something because it is a contradiction. In the last three months, I've just collected advertisements from companies. Now, if environment doesn't matter, why does BP put its entire corporate advertising behind the slogan saying electric cars won't happen overnight, etc., and we need to reduce sulfur and environmental theme? Canon its whole identity, wildlife as we see it, Swiss advertising itself through climate protection, 
Daimler Chrysler, would you believe with a hummingbird hanging off the end of an exhaust pipe of a car? The hydrogen economy. Toyota, zero emissions. Shell, why green is good. Now, some people might say this is just advertising. This is just greenwash. I think for us, the really interesting question is which one of these five or six companies will be around in 10 years' time and will be earning the kind of return on investment that 90% of business is not even willing to discuss today. And that is why in IUCN we try and find those companies that we believe have begun to think about. And I would challenge Travis and Mark also. You lead companies where you are trying to lead change. Your companies have not yet changed in the way you have described. And the fact is, what does society do? How does it reward companies who do something about it, even if it takes time to change? And how does it sanction companies who can't be bothered to even engage with the public on those issues? That I see partly the role of environmental organizations to help every one of us to be able to see the distinction between these approaches. This would signify that environmental organizations should be able to rate companies. It's a tough job, but yes, ultimately I'd love to do it, except at the moment I wouldn't dare to do it because we don't know how to do it and we would get sued by one company after another for the way we rate them. <laughs> okay, Mark, what do you say to the statement of, of, uh, of Achim, uh, which is a powerful statement in my view? No, I, think, I, I think there are ways of, of rating companies because I think through, through the transparency, which if I am a, a strong believer that, that these issues cannot be addressed by one sector. They cannot be addressed just by business. They can't be addressed just by civil society organization. They can't be addressed just by government. So we have to work together. In order to work together, we have to rebuild trust. And trust in business is certainly at a very low level. The way to rebuild trust is through greater transparency and through saying what we intend to do and then reporting on it and reporting on it in credible ways. Through things like the Global Reporting Initiative, which I also have an involvement in, I believe out of that come valuable things for companies, ways of companies benchmarking their own performance, but society also judging whether companies are actually doing what they claim to be doing. And a company which claims to be doing something and is demonstrated repeatedly and, and uh, vicariously not to be doing it, will be punished by, by its customers, by, by society, and probably by government. Travis, more transparency. That would signify also to report or to communicate on dilemmas, on problems, on internal constraints, external constraints. Do you do that already? Yes. Uh, we began uh, with our first sustainability report uh, just two years ago, early, um, early in the time I've been with Alcan. But in this, we laid out a very, very clear business case for sustainability and talked about all of the aspects of each of the processes and, and kinds of businesses that, that are in Alcan. Uh, there are issues, obviously. Uh, there are issues of w simply what is the right thing to do. I mean, there, there are some still knowledge gaps, obviously. And um, just as in the 50s and 60s, there were practices which were deemed to be best practice, we now know we're, we're not, not right um, in industry at large, not, not uh, specifically in Alcan. Uh, on this question, uh, there were a whole bunch of issues which were raised in discussion. Uh, we are working very carefully, not just on the GRI, as, as Mark indicated, but also within the Rural Business Council for Sustainable Development, there is an accountability and reporting task force because the issues are different region to region, place to place, uh, as has been pointed out. I mean, we are involved, for example, in Brazil in a, in a bauxite mine we discovered uh, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, we have planted today over 5 million trees, 4,000 species. Uh, we've had a special focus on, on saving uh, Brazilian chestnut and a couple of other species which end up leading us down the path of, <laughs> believe it or not, the insects that were pollinating and so, you know, you learn a lot as you go along here. Uh, we have 
Uh, hydropower is a major source, obviously, of the energy we use in the production of aluminum, and that quite naturally leads to some very important fish species, both salmon in, 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 the north of, in the western part of North America and the eastern part of North America, but other species in other regions. So there are many, many things that go on there. The challenge for us is how do we get not one actor at the top, not two actors, but how do we get everybody broadly engaged? Now, we have some advantage in here because, frankly, this whole topic area, not just biodiversity, but the whole broad area, is absolutely at the intersection of in the, the public life in our company and the private lives that our employees have outside of the firm. And we see that in, in all employee surveys. The highest rated area in our employee surveys are always environmental health and safety. I'm be, and I, I'm, this is true, I've been in, in a number of firms, it's been true in every place I've ever seen it, much, much higher. And I think the reason is because the issues that we're working on in our firm are not the same as you see in private life, but they are aligned with the private life issues which we all experience, whether it's living in a city where perhaps there's too much uh, uh, smoke or smog or something coming from automobiles and, and, and. So what I have been focused on in Alcan is how do we lead this change? Because, uh, and there are many tools, and in fact, we announced one of them today, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it, but we have for your years had a program, a community investment program, which is the way we reinvest resources in the community for grants, financial support, manpower, uh, we make our facilities available where that's useful uh, for, for local action and so on and so forth. We reached a decision after looking at this for over a year, uh, which we, and we announced the decision today, that we are absolutely aligning our community investment program around sustainability. And the centerpiece for that is what we've called today the Alcan Prize for Sustainability. It's a million dollar annual prize to an NGO or government, uh, non-governmental organization, civil society organization, not-for-profit, for work that has been done successfully and will be continuing. So it's, it's a huge opportunity for us. But the most important thing is this we see as a way to bring into greater alignment the actions of the 88,000 people in the company and the needs that we need to drive forward as a society. Thank you, Travis. Der Moment ist gekommen, sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, um nun auch Ihnen die Gelegenheit... Now the time has come, ladies and gentlemen, to give you an opportunity to put your questions or to make your comments. And uh, could you be as concise as possible, as brief as possible, succinct as possible, so that we can have a real dialogue, so that your concerns and uh, the know-how around this table can be brought together? So just introduce yourself briefly and uh, indicate your question or your comment. And you can direct your question to any individual on the panel or all the panel. And we're, there are two microphones on the left and the right. Uh, these are roving mics. So who could I give the floor to? I'm going to speak German. No, that's no problem, says the moderator. Go ahead, you can speak German. Now, s sustainability as such is one issue. It has to be visible to the population that How is sustainability going to be communicated? It's not just individual firms that position themselves. Uh, how can firms get together? How can they pool their efforts? Um, I'm saying this with reference to a particular project here in Switzerland. It's the for the end user, there has to be a point where they can update themselves and they can know what the state of the art is and actually where we're going, the moderator. Well, you're, you could put this in terms of a geographical cluster, a cluster of firms which are particularly concerned with sustainability, if I understand the thrust of your question. Sustainability clusters are, are an illusion or a possible reality, Travis? Well, I think Mark was very much involved in the World Business Council for Sustainable Development before I have been, but 
this is a global organization, but under the umbrella of that, there are national and regional business councils for sustainable development. And I have to say that it's a, an area where there is still a great deal of learning going on. Uh, at the global level, it's about 150 major corporations, some not so major from all over, all over the planet. And we are not only operating at the global level on task forces, for example, like the one on accountability reporting, uh, which I mentioned a moment ago, but also water and a number of other key issues that, that cut across all kinds of industries. But more importantly, we're also involved in helping the national and regional business councils begin to get traction and develop um, appropriate fora for learning, cross-fertilization, and bringing some of these things forward to a better state. What is not happening, and I think this was the thrust of the question, is how can a layperson learn the state of the art? And, and I actually, I don't know, I can't answer that question. Yeah, Ashok, is there any, any uh, knowledge from your side about uh, clustering, geographical clustering of sustainability-oriented firms? Do you know anything? Um, yeah, we, we um, do this um, in um, places where it's possible to use the waste of one industry to be the raw materials of another. There's ways in which you can have common pollution treatment plants and a variety of other things. But when you're talking about biodiversity on a large scale, this is not an option. I mean, you're talking about large regional impacts, and clustering is not a meaningful concept, I don't think, for that. Okay. Übrigens habe ich vergessen zu sagen, dass I forgot to say that uh, uh, Mr. Roy comes from the same sort of background as I do, and that's particularly, uh, have, uh, I, I like that. Uh, let's continue now. Klaus Hoon is my name. Klaus Hoon. I'm an engineer. So that requires me to think logically uh, in order to come up with a, a, an outcome which is acceptable, and that's dangerous, says somebody. Uh, then, of course, if it collapses, if it, does, if, it, if it doesn't work out, then it's my fault. Now, so uh, there's something critical I'd like to mention here. When we're talking about resources, natural resources, as well as our human capital, we're talking about things that are that are not necessarily immediately at hand. We, we, we use them and uh, we have... <laughs> but what is of particular concern to me, and let me just read this out briefly and then comment upon it. And I saw and see a white horse and sitting upon it had a bow, and he was given a victor's uh, laurels, and and he then went forth in order to be victorious. And uh, and then the second living being said, "Come," and uh, brought forth a another horse, a fire red horse, and upon that horse sat one to whom it was given to take the peace from the world or the earth. Uh, and to bring people to slaughter one another, to slaughter each other, and to him was given a, a great sword. I don't know if you're familiar with this text. Uh, and, and then there are two more horses. This sounds like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, so th this is a prophetic warning which is valid for today. This applies to the WF for the whole conference, and it is a challenge. It is. Uh, this is a question to everybody here. Who, who is to be your God? To, to whom really do you wish to pay tribute? Well, we take that as a message, says the uh, moderator, but I'm not sure that that's something that we can comment on um, up here on the podium. No microphone. Well, so that's your question then, is it? Can, can you turn that into a question, says the moderator. When
when will you derive the wisdom to do things in such a way that what I just read out to you doesn't come to pass? The moderator, well, of course, we don't know what the attitude of our panelists is to, to the divine or to, 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 to God. I think that goes a bit beyond the boundaries of this panel, wouldn't you say? And uh, maybe if you agree, we could perhaps take that up afterwards, uh, if you would like to. So Mark wants to respond. I would just say that that, to me, is a, is a question not just for this panel, but for society as a whole. Uh, I keep coming back to the fact that business is a part of society. We deliver services which are required by consumers, and it, it is those services are delivered within a social framework which are governed by issues such as the ones that you were addressing. That is a question for society. It's a question for me, it's a question for you, it's a question for all of you. And until we work seriously on the answers to those questions, we're not going to get the answer. Philip Rock. Well, let me try briefly to give you a response, a simpler material. And the answer is sustainable development. It is sp a sparing use of capital, a sparing use of the creation, the wise use of the creation and respect for the creation. And with our very modest means, that is precisely what we are trying to achieve here. Okay, ich habe hier Thank you, says the moderator. There's s somebody in a violet shirt, I think, so far as I'm able to judge. I have a, a question about biodiversity. We have a great variety of people here on your panel, but all agree, as I understand it, on the importance of biodiversity. But there are other firms who don't feel the same way about biodiversity. What, what are you going to do about them? What are we going to do about firms which don't concern themselves uh, about dio biodiversity? Thank you for the question, says the moderator. Firms, not performing firms, saying biodiversity issues uh, will be erased from the market in a certain way. Uh, Achim said, not directly but indirectly, we need strong legal ground that uh, this may not happen in future. Okay. How do you think about this? And also, Mark. Well, it's uh, actually the question which most often I find um, asked in, in settings like this is, why don't others understand or see the same thing you see? Other firms, other individuals. And I actually, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I think in part, uh, it, it may be looking at a more limited horizon and not understanding things. I do have a belief. I would like to argue with something which Aslak said earlier, which is that, that uh, in many cases there are smaller firms who are behaving better in these respects. I actually think that, that larger firms tend to have more evolved systems and governance processes, and in many cases, because some of the areas are quite complex, larger knowledge about the technical matters. Um, but I don't know. And, and my approach to, to trying to engage others in this is to person by person, firm by firm, um, to move forward together. I can tell you one thing is for sure. When we pick business partners, we're very careful about who we partner with. We want people to, who share our values and who are going to help us learn and progress as well. Uh, and so to a certain extent, maybe this is a this is our form of clusters, the question that was raised earlier. It's not industry associations, it's commercial relationships which we're building on. And it extends to not just firms, but, but uh, individuals we might work with in one region or the other as well. So I don't know the answer, except I think it's a collective problem we all have to try to progress on individual by individual, firm by firm. Mark? I, th I think we need to address the role of, of regulation because it, it is, of course, cloud cuckoo land to assume that everyone is motivated by goodwill and, and sound sense. And that applies to corporations and to, to individuals. So there clearly has to be a role for appropriate regulation. And uh, business and markets cannot operate 
without appropriate regulation. A, in any market, you start any sort of market, forms of regulation will come in on transparency, on pricing, on quality, on etc. The forms of regulation, I think, are there's, there's a, what you might call a tracking form of regulation where uh, leading companies, in conjunction very often with addressing issues raised by civil society organizations, which those leading organizations may well not have been aware of, start to uh, say there's something in this, let's work together, see whether we can address it. You hope that if those companies get some credit for it from shareholders, from consumers, a certain number of others will join. But, but you will never get everyone into the tent like that. The, there has to be at a certain role, a certain point, a kind of uh, catch-up legislation to, to bring, and we've seen this over decades with labor standards and so on, things which were done initially by, by visionaries, by what would then, I mean, social reformers, who were the equivalent 100 years ago of, of NGOs. They, those labor standards then get put into law. But equally important is what I call leading legislation. And there are some issues, some issues relating to, to common good, uh, which will not be, cannot be addressed simply by leading firms. And those particularly relate to things like climate. And in that, you need regulatory frameworks, frameworks which guide efficiency, which apply as much to consumers as corporations, inefficiency of the, the use of energy, the sort of things that Ashok was talking about, which, which set regulatory frameworks within which the market can operate in imaginative ways to deliver solutions and with, with competition. And that is absolutely fundamental. And that requires uh, businesses, we have consumers, uh, and within that framework in a market we can compete to meet things within that regulatory framework, but the regulatory frameworks have to be set up by governments and they have to be acceptable to those same uh, consumers. So we have a kind of triangle, consumers who vote for governments and, and buy from businesses and a relationship between business and government. And I believe that that proactive re uh, regulatory framework rightly done is absolutely essential. What we cannot live with in business is regulation which, which not only tells us what we have to do and the direction that we have to go in, but exactly in every detail how to do it normally uh, on yesterday's technology. That way you have a static society, our hands are bound, all the fun goes out of it and I would definitely retire. Philip, shortly. I just want to to follow up on what uh, Mark said, there is one uh, aspect of the, the problematic as a response for this very important question. What can government do? On this question, we need a multilateral agreement to have worldwide the same regulations. And you know how difficult it is to get a consensus because this system, international, <coughs> works with consensus. That's the reason why, for example, for forestry, or fisheries, two very important issues which uh, deal with biodiversity. We don't have global agreements. We cannot achieve an agreement on that. And even on climate change, where we got an agreement, we are very weak. We cannot really get strong regulation internationally. And that's the reason why we are condemned. It's a good condemnation, but condemned to work together to try to push the multilateral agreements, but at the same time to get from the business sector that it takes its own responsibility and the importance of the public in this issue, the triangle, is important. That's why we don't have a, a, a magic response for that. We just have to push each possibility to, to get to the, to the result. Also Ihre Frage hat viel Interesse geweckt. Well, your question aroused a great deal of interest. And perhaps I could help Travis a little um, not to be quite so diplomatic. I don't think the pri price simply isn't set high enough. The price, the, the, pr the firms, 
the firms that want to deal with these issues, uh, there's a certain price for this. And as long as we're not in a position, on the one hand, in regard to those firms which are not prepared to do this uh, in an open and transparent way, and uh, but on, by contrast, to, to reward firms that are prepared to go that way, uh, the, the, the rationale is simply not there for it. Most the the effect uh, in environmental destruction and all the rest of it continues. It's an absolute effect. But, but uh, we have an environmental movement which itself uh, throws up a problem. We have one group which concentrates on on the, the attack, and and this is absolutely legitimate. That's their that's their chosen method. Whether it's uh, WWF or Greenpeace or what have you in recent years, um, they bring pressure to bear on public opinion. Um, uh, and that's how, that's what has opened doors over the years. And you, when you didn't have CEOs like Mark or others uh, who called into question the entire culture uh, in Shell or elsewhere. And we've seen in in the press that the pre that the pressure w was increased because part of their they don't have part of their reserves. So what happens in a situation like that? Is it the economic logic which it comes to the fore, in which case the whole sustainability philosophy drops out, or can Shell hang on? Can can they hang in there and say that this is it's going to go on being important for us as business people? But we have to be able to, to cast the, the spotlight on those who are unwilling to go along in, in such a way that they can't go on indefinitely like that. Well, the, the moderator, there are many questions here. We have one or two time for one or two more questions from the audience. Mr. Stickelberger, bread for all, one of the co-organizers of this forum. I would like to build a bridge between biodiversity and globalization. These two two topics. If we if we look at the, th we've heard the three challenges which have been mentioned. Isn't one of the central problems transport? Bio the threats to bio biodiversity uh, are seen in. Um, climate change and in the transfer of species, uh, which has to do with mobility and uh, modern transport means, and modern the modern networking, and this is characteristic of modern globalization. W wouldn't we have to say that for reasons of biodiversity, in the long term, this kind of international net no creation of networks is not sustainable? In other words, there is a bio, there's a there's a biodiversity limit which does not permit us to continue this globalizing networking. Or putting it another way, lo looking at the transport costs for aluminium or whatever it is, if if we if we at least if what the what would the economy look like if we were at a minimum to to triple the cost of transports which is what we would act, we would actually have to do for it to be environmentally meaningful if transport costs were three times what they are today what would happen to the goods to the services isn't that too isn't that too painful and yet isn't this something which is inevitable which is which is which if we want to take seriously the demand for protecting di biodiversity won't we have to do this and that brings up the idea of bioregionalism don't we need to look at smaller environmental areas where a regional approach might be one solution that's just a question the moderator tripling the costs of transport well, there might be two justifications for this. One would be in order to reflect the full environmental costs and to build that into the, into the transport costs. That's what I suppose is the rationale for a, for a trebling. And, but, and the, but the second reason for this would be to put the brakes on, on, on the dynamic of globalization. 
Well, in connection with biodiversity, looking at the full environmental cost, and that, of course, includes the cost to biodiversity. If we, would, if we want to include all of those costs, then we would be moving in that sort of direction, according to the calculations that have been made by experts. Speaking was um, two thoughts. One is a collapse of the connectedness of the planet down to, say, regions or, or smaller than that even, would be very much going backwards with respect to human development. And I, I don't think that actually that would be good because we would end up with more separateness rather than more togetherness on other issues. But the other thing that occurred to me, and I say this quite with some humor, I hope, is it would be fabulous for aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> aluminum used in transport at today's prices as a very positive life cycle cost. I mean, it saves energy, massively saves energy. And so, I mean, I would, I would, I would support you in this dimension, but maybe not on the human side. <laughs> very shortly, Mark, and then we have to conclude here. Yeah, if you look at the, the growth of energy demand, I mean, energy d demand will probably double in the next uh, 30, 40 years. And this is a, clearly has major potential climate impacts. The bulk of that energy demand is not in the developed world, it's in the developing world. And in the developing world, I do not believe in China and India that you will say to them that they cannot have personal transportation. A lot of it is driven by personal transportation. The answer is not to say to people you cannot have it, is to work out methods of delivering it at radically uh, more higher levels of efficiency, which is not difficult. I mean, just look at this room. There are umpteen you know, filament lights, the least efficient form of lighting. We just haven't started on, on energy efficiency. Meine Damen und Herren, wir kommen in die Ladies and gentlemen, well, we are coming to the close. Since uh, we're supposed to finish around half past seven, I'm sure that we could go on having very interesting discussions for quite some time. But I have a final question to put to our panelists. And while they're thinking about that, uh, uh, we will give them everybody 15 seconds to, uh, to reply. Um, uh, I would like, while they're thinking about that, to venture some conclusions in, a, in two or three minutes uh, to give you the impressions that I have received from this discussion. Forward to the panelists, and you have afterwards 15 seconds each, 20 maybe, to respond to it. If you would have one wish, one wish huh? concerning the intulation of biodiversity protection and private business. What would be this one wish? Okay, we have some time to think about it, two, three minutes. In dieser Zeit will ich Ihnen meine... And in that time, I would like briefly to present my own impressions so that you can think over what your impressions have been. First of all, I think it's clear that biodiversity is, is in danger. We have seen what the most important dangers are, and these dangers are arising from business, from uh, activity, but also from society. And, of course, most of that activity is in the service of consumers. And so it is what the consumers actually demand. Uh, we need to look more in greater depth at that. We've only scratched the surface, of course, uh, and these things need to be looked at more closely. My second comment is this. We've heard that, that there are very likely Good, motive, good motives, good reasons for private business to, to look beyond the legislative requirements and to take a constructive approach to biodiversity. We've heard two examples here of attempts to move forward where the motives on the one hand 
are to achieve better productivity and uh, efficiency in the firm, in the company, and on the other hand, and I think this is at least as important uh, a motive, and that is reputation, or uh, not to lose reputation. Um, where you have your domicile and where you are represented on the stock market. And if something goes wrong, it has an adverse effect on your uh, reputation, and that in turn um, has a knock-on effect on your stock market values. That, was, that has actually been the case. Third comment, obviously there is uh, an important need for legislation. Not all firms are pioneers in this. They're not all proactive. And so there is need for, a, for clear rules of the game for market players. By analogy with football, for example, you need uh, uniform rules worldwide. You, you can't have the goalposts closer together in one country. Uh, you can't have a different size of football field in different countries, and so on. Or you can't have a different. You can't have. Uh, you can't have different sizes of team. The rules of the game have to be have to be uniform. If on a global level, worldwide, there is to be an effective basis uh, on which to proceed. So the legislative basis has to be strong and clear and respected. At least that's what I've been hearing this evening. Not everybody is going to be equally happy with this, of course, as, as we have been on the panel. Fourth and last point, beyond legislation, clearly it is public opinion that is a decisive factor public information, public debate, the role of non-governmental organizations and uh, civil society organizations, the dialogue uh, between those associations and business, that critical dialogue, all of this is clearly uh, of critical importance in, in fostering a better and more future-oriented conduct on the part of firms. Hence the that is why NGOs are so enormously important now, and that is why I think all panelists have said one way or another that the dialogue between NGOs and business and NGOs and government and private business is extraordinarily important. A critical dialogue, however, one which can also trigger uh, solutions. That's my own personal fourth impression. and. I would invite you to think through your own impressions and, uh, to, and to try and do something in your own sphere of influence. Okay. Ashok, your wish. Well, my one wish would be that uh, every government has graded liability laws and uh, the badder your, your performance, uh, the bigger your liability. Uh, you just have to look at Union Carbide or Enron and see what happens if you behave badly. And I think that alone would take us a long way towards solving the problem. Thank you. Philip. Difficult uh, answer, but I, I choose to say that I would uh, really wish that in the uh, company uh, accountability, we have a parallel accountability towards biodiversity. Uh, capital and interest and benefits for biodiversity because we all depend on that. And we at least could have this uh, conscience that uh, on the value, not only the economical, but the overall value of biodiversity, we would make progress. But this is, is an idealistic view. I know that we will not reach that soon. Mark, I would throw all the effort of business, international business and, and local national business, working with civil society on a, on a national and local scale, not transnational, within each and every country and labor organization to deliver the governance systems, including governance of business, which will deliver some of these uh, goods. Because it's, it's, if you take a country like Indonesia, the same governance system would prevent the illegal logging. 
it would ensure that, that the wealth generated by business and society was more equitably distributed, and it would make it a very much better place to do business. We'd all be happier. Thank you, Achim Steiner. Thank you, Achim Steiner. As a co-initiator of this panel, what is your wish? That, uh, well, if we come back to this subject next year, then maybe we'll have 20 or 30 CEOs who would, uh, who would want to be represented here because I think that's the best indicator that we are making progress. And, and why, not bi why not just the environment in general? Why, not, why just biodiversity? Because the loss in biodiversity actually threatens the whole basis of existence on this planet. And the concept of environment is always being dismembered or broken down or fragmented. So we, we don't actually, we're not actually able to grasp how serious the threats to the environment as such uh, is. But next year, I want to see a queue of 30 people out there. Well, with that, says the moderator, I'd like to close this panel. Thank you very much for your interest and for coming. And uh, in regard to the, and I'd, however, we get your prize. <laughs> <laughs> I began to wonder, as a phrase in uh, North America, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> I, I think very specifically, notwithstanding the concrete, real examples that we have of specific species issues and the like that we are really at the earliest days of understanding this. If I took Occam's point well, it's the biodiversity is the leading indicator on so many other things, or the success, maintaining biodiversity is an indicator of success in doing other things well. But I actually believe that we are still at the early days here, and so for me, this, the one wish would be the development of greater knowledge and much larger public discourse, some of which obviously we've had here, but it's got to go far beyond these kinds of settings, and it will influence public and governmental policy, and I think it will it'll take us to the right place. Herzlichen Dank, Travis, und nochmals Entschuldigung. Thank you very much, and apologies once more. I like to thank you warmly for your interest and your commitment to your interest in this central question for humankind of sustainable development. All of us, I think, would wish to give a, a, a round of applause to our panelists for their commitment. Gute Heimreise.